want you to put your hands together and welcome Jesus to this place this morning. Amen? And on top of that, I want you to put your hands together and welcome Pastor Greg. Thank you, Pastor Cliff. And happy Father's Day to all the fathers. And happy belated Mother's Day. It's, uh, it's great to be here again. We were doing this last year, and I think I remember some faces here. How many of you guys, and I'm talking to you kids right now, how many of you know what baptism is? You know what baptism is? What's baptism? Dip in the river. What do you think it is? Good. So that's what we do. But what does it mean? See, and that's what we're going to talk about. Okay. You guys, you guys see these here? You guys see these here? These are the big ones, okay? I wasn't going cheap this year, I'm going big. All right, so you guys gotta pay attention. Now, remember last year I forgot at the end to do my little quiz with you guys? So you guys gotta say, uh, Pastor Greg, we gotta do the quiz because we're going home with one of those. All right? Okay, so, all right. So we're gonna go home with one of these. Let I'm gonna put them right here for now. I'm going to put that there for now. Okay. So first of all, I'm going to teach you a word. And if you get, if you can say it with me, it's a Greek word. I'm going to teach you a new word. It's called baptizo. Say it with me. Baptizo. Baptizo. You all said it. Good. And you know what? That's the word in the Bible that talks about being put under the water what does it mean that's what we're going to get to so I want you to pay really close attention remember that word because that's one of the well that's going to be probably one of the questions baptizo let's say it one more time and it means to dip or to go under okay so that's what we do when we put somebody under the water now we don't want to hold them there too long right <laughs> When we do baptism, somebody want to do a long baptism, that's not a good thing. That's a different story altogether, okay? So we want to make sure that we put them under. But I'm going to tell you a couple of stories first. How many of you have ever seen a baptism in a church? We've been doing them at the lake, but how many of you have seen them in the church and they got a big tank up there and they go down in the tank? Yeah. Well, a friend of ours one time, she was telling us she knew that the baptism was coming up the next on Sunday and so uh, somehow she got a key with one of her friends and they went into the church the night before and they put a surprise in the water for the pastor the next morning so next morning the pastor gets up and he starts to wade into the baptismal tank and you know what he sees he sees goldfish <laughs> floating all around his legs tickling him all over the place yeah, he tried tried hard not to, you know, he was, he was, I'm not sure whether he was mad or would just kind of thought it was pretty funny. Okay, but, but that doesn't mean, you guys can put goldfish in the lake if you want. Do we have a baptismal tank at the church? Yeah? Okay, good. You guys remember that? Okay. So there's another, this one's on YouTube. I saw this one on YouTube and this is really funny. So the, the pastor is getting ready. He's standing in the water and he's getting ready to baptize somebody. And I think it's his son. And all of a sudden, his son didn't walk into the, the water. His son comes up and he does a cannonball. How many of you have seen that on, on YouTube? You know what a cannonball is? Yeah, you know what a cannonball is. So, so it was pretty funny to see the expression of dad's face when his son does a cannonball into the baptismal tank. I'm sure they had a conversation after. And there's another time, a guy, he was so excited. He, he went into the water 
and 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 he he came up. He was so excited because he this was such an important point or moment in his life. And you know what happened? So when he came up out of the water, he started walking to the ladies' side of the change room. Uh oh. <laughs> So he gets over and he, he's kind of sitting on the stairs and he's going, oh my goodness, how did I do that? So then he's thinking, oh, I know what I'm going to do. He says, when the pastor starts to dunk the next person, I'm just going to swim across to the other side. Good plan, right? So unbeknownst to him, as he's swimming across, he doesn't realize it's a plexiglass. And the whole church is watching him. So many things can happen during a baptism service, okay? And, and we may see something funny happen here today. Uh, you know, one of these geese might walk over here and decide that they want to get baptized. I don't think so. It's pretty hard to get a geese under the water. No, many, many are a geese, all right? Baptism is uh, an important step in every person who has said yes to Jesus. I said yes to Jesus when I was seven years old, but I waited about 11 years. And I didn't realize the importance of the, of the step when I, when I first met Jesus. And sometimes we put people on hold because we think they're not ready for it, but that's not what the Bible teaches. The very first time that we see in the New Testament in the book of Acts, and it's the same day that the Holy Spirit came upon the church. Now, there was other baptisms, but this was a special moment in time because it wasn't just... There was two baptisms that took place that day. There was the baptism of the Spirit where it came down and the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit, but it was also when the people came and they said, what do we do? First of all, they said, what does this mean? when the Holy Spirit came down. Those are two good questions that we need to ask God a lot of times. When stuff happens in our life, we need to say, God, what does this mean? And the second question is they came to the disciples and they said, what must we do? Remember those two questions when you're going through life and sometimes stuff happens. You need to first of all go to the Lord and say, God, what, what does this mean? Because God is always doing upgrades in our life. I want to say this again. I've said it before. There are no downgrades in the kingdom. There's not a single demotion in the kingdom of God. God is always wanting us to step up higher. He's wanting us to grow into the things that make us fully human and fully alive. And baptism is not an option for a believer. If you're here today and you've been a believer for a long time and you've been saying, no, nah, I'm not baptized, I'm not... No, it's not an option. It's actually the first step of obedience that we take. And I think it's, there's a reason for it. First of all, it's public. Uh, just recently, uh, some friend, so, uh, one of my good friends was doing baptisms of... Of, of Iranian Muslims in uh, in Turkey in the Black Sea and this was on the highest holiest day of Islam where these Muslim believers knowing the cost that it was going to that it could have been because when a, when a Muslim steps out of, of Islam and takes a step of faith in any other direction they have they basically said, I'm willing to die. We don't, have, we don't have that threat here. On the highest, holiest day, these believers were standing in, a, in an ocean. It was actually pretty funny watching these believers with the, the waves coming in and getting knocked over. But you know what? There was so much joy, so much thrill to be able to say, I'm willing to give my life. You see, that's what baptism is partially about is where we take a stand and we say first of all when we go Paul says in in Romans chapter 6 he says that we identify with Jesus in his dying now this is probably one of the most important things that is bypassed so often in the body of Christ 
And when we talk about this, this is something. We, we have to get this. Jesus did not come to make bad men good. Let me say that again. Jesus did not come to make bad men good. He came to make dead men live. And when we go into the water, we are saying, Jesus, I identify with the fact that I have died to sin. Because that's what Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. He says, first of all, he says, do we continue to sin? He says, no, you've died to sin. You don't continue to want to sin in your life. When I mess up in my life, and I have so many times, I feel terrible. I feel absolutely gross, sick, and, and disgusted most often with myself. Why? Because it's not compatible with the new life that Jesus came to bring me. If you are happy, if you can go ahead and sin, and you feel great about it, and that's the greatest thing in your life, I'll guarantee you're not a follower of Jesus. Because when you mess up, the Spirit of God is in you and convicts you immediately about what you've done. We have died to sin. That's what that means. And it means that we have died. Everybody says, we've died to sin. You see, the enemy comes along and he says, no, 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 you're still a sinner. You still mess up. And so we continue to listen to the lie of the enemy that says, I am not a new creature in Christ. No, you're still the old guy. If you were a new creature in Christ, you wouldn't be doing this ugly stuff that you're doing. You wouldn't, be, you wouldn't be doing all this stuff. You wouldn't be saying all this stuff. You wouldn't be thinking all this stuff. So the very fact that you're doing all this stuff that you used to do means that you're not a new creature in Christ. And part of pastoral ministry that sometimes we miss is helping people know you're dead to that. You are alive to this. <coughs> we die to sin. Our old nature, it says that we now have the divine nature. In 2 Peter chapter 3, or 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. God has given us three things. He's given us the divine nature, He's given us divine power, and He's given us divine promises. He's given us every blessing, it says in Ephesians chapter 1. He's blessed us with every blessing in the heavenly places. We don't have to beg God for blessing. God bless me. I do that a lot. And then I hear the Spirit saying, you don't have to beg. You don't have to plead. Thank me for what I blessed you with. God is not angry. Can I, can I say this? God is not angry. Not even with the unbeliever. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 19, Paul says very clearly, he says, we, because we are in Christ and we're compelled by love, we no longer look at anyone from a fleshly point of view. We don't look at somebody and say, oh, I get to judge them because they're living this life. No. Judgment has no place in the life of a believer. Why? Because we have died to sin. We've died to the old way of life. We've died to the old. The old nature is dead. Let it die. Let it stay in the grave. That's what God has called us to. And when we come out of the water, we are coming into the, we're recognizing, I have stepped into the resurrection life. He says, in the new and glorious way that we walk now. But most believers don't walk in the new and glorious way. We still are being dragged back and listening to the lies. And that's why there's so much joylessness in the church. And I've struggled with that my whole life. Because I've, I've listened to those lies. I've believed those lies for so long. And yet God is saying, no, Greg, this is not who you are. That's gone. This is who I created you to be. And I created you to walk in the fullness of everything that you were created to be. So baptism is absolutely essential to walk in because, first of all, when we go under the water, it's a messy thing. Life is messy, correct? Anybody here got a absolutely uh, charismatic, wonderful life? You've got one there, Sylvain? Yeah, we all know that's true. <laughs> 
We've got messy lives, and you know what? Baptism is messy. You get wet, you get drenched. We don't want to get drenched. I'm a, you know, I love the water, but you know what? Sometimes I like the dry land a little bit better. You know, you get older and you go, ah, I don't, I don't want to get grit between my toes. But you know what? Life is messy and so is baptism. But it's also a willingness to say, you know what? I want to identify with Jesus. There's a humbling process that takes place that says, you know what? I don't care what people think because you know what? There's a lot of people that are watching. They're, they're thinking, what, what's going on here? What, what about these crazy Christians? Do you know what? It's the love of God. It's the love of God. And let me say it again. It's the love of God in us that flows through us that's going to change the world. It's not going to be anything else. It's not going to be our doctrines. It's not going to be, you know... It's going to be how we live our lives day to day, loving people, not counting, not judging them in the flesh, but seeing the spirit that is alive in us that wants to ignite the, the spirit that could be alive in somebody else. I try really hard when I, when I, when I engage with people to see the best about people. I don't always, because there's still that tugging of the old nature that wants to to judge somebody immediately by appearance. But remember what God said in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. God said, I do not judge by appearance. I judge what's in the heart. And we may see somebody and we think, oh man, they're a write-off, and God is saying, no, that's my next David. You see, we never know what God sees. And so we have to treat every person with grace and dignity, no matter what they're into what lifestyle they've gone into what doesn't matter because God says I love you I love you because I love you I want to read uh, in closing I want to just read how many of you have heard of Paul Harvey not Paul Harvey and Vernon but remember the commentator Paul Harvey and now for the rest of the story that's right Paul Harvey was a commentator on the radio and I loved listening to him I got one of his books one time Paul Harvey would tell a story and then there'd be he'd kind of leave you hanging and then he'd say and now he, there'd be commercial and then he'd say and now for the rest of the story and then he'd fill in what we didn't know about this amazing story that he was telling at the beginning well Paul Harvey had his own baptism experience and it was a spontaneous baptism just like we're doing here today and I want to read his story if I can see it so Paul Harvey was on vacation they ended up at a little church on a hilltop in a clearing and this is what he said when the preacher got up he announced that his sermon was going to be about baptism and he said, I yawned, but as he started to talk about it, I found myself interested. He talked about the symbolism behind it, and he said it symbolized surrender to Jesus Christ. He insisted that there was nothing magic in the water, but he said a cleansing took place inside you when you yielded yourself to Jesus. And Paul Harvey said, he surprised even himself when he stood up and walked to the front when the preacher offered an invitation to be baptized. He describes what happened. He said the preacher had said that there was nothing magic in the water. Yet as I descended into the depths and rose again, I knew that something life-changing had happened. Harvey went on. He says the change this simple act made in my life is so immense as to be indescribable. Since totally yielding to him in baptism, my heart can't stop singing. Also, perhaps because baptism is such a public act, and because one's dignity gets as drenched as one's body, I discovered a new unselfconsciousness in talking about my beliefs. That's what it's about. 
It's about saying yes to Jesus in every part of our life. Because it's a full surrender. It's not a half surrender. It's a dying to self and saying, I want to live to the praise of your glory all the days of my life. Does that mean we won't sin? Does that mean we won't mess up? Does that mean we won't have bad days? No. But it means that we will have a forever friend. And you guys, I want you to remember this, you young guys here. Jesus, when I asked Jesus into my life when I was seven years old, at that time in my life, I had wanted one thing. I had wanted a best friend. There was a buddy that I had got to know at school. His name was Jeff Scott. And Jeff and I became good friends. And sometimes when we couldn't get together on the weekends, I'd, I'd be really sad. Because I wanted a best friend. But God gave me a best friend when I was seven years old. Because at a vacation Bible school one day, there was a call and they said, if you want to receive Jesus, come to the front. And I did that. And you know what? That day God gave me my best friend who has never left me or forsaken me. And I've walked with him now for 54 years. Or actually, he's walked with me. He's lived inside of me by his spirit. And you guys will never have a better friend in this life than Jesus. And I just want to encourage you. Even where you're at in this life, right now, you can say yes to Jesus. So I'm just going to invite Cliff. Let me pray first. Guys, um, this, is, this is it. This is an easy question. What is the word? What's the Greek word that we learned? Say, okay, I, you got the hand up first. Baptizo, you got it. Can you say it? Well, can you say it? And what does it mean? Going under to be dipped. Good. So you guys all get one of those. Maybe a couple, because I got lots. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your love, your kindness, your goodness, your faithfulness to us. And I thank you for those who are taking this step today. Father, I pray that they just there would be a song in their hearts and their lives. Lord, we know that this isn't the place of, 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 of salvation, but it's the first step of obedience to a life of incredible friendship with you. And so I just pray, Father, for those who are being baptized and those who might be thinking right now, yeah, I need to do this. I pray, Father, that you would give them courage, the encouragement of your spirit right now to do what they know they need to do. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.